Critics. Every area of life has critics. Even Muppet movies have critics. You have music critics, right? You have movie critics, you have art critics, you have food critics, fashion critics, political critics. And I don't know if you know um, their names. This would actually be great for trivia someday. But that's Statler and Waldorf. Okay, Statler and Waldorf. Um, they are the two guys in the balcony in the Muppet movies. If you've ever seen Muppet Show or the Muppet movies or any of the uh, things there with those puppets, these guys, Statler and Waldorf, were the ones who made fun of the, the Muppet movie. And, and they would stop and cut over to the critics who would like just tear the thing apart and laugh at it and tell all these sarcastic jokes and everything else. So even in the midst of that, there was somebody to criticize and to be a critic. And oftentimes the critics are right, right? I mean, you would think that one of the best jobs in the world has to be being a food critic. Are you kidding me? You get to go places, eat for free, and then criticize them? Um, what if I did that at home? Um, you know, <laughs> how well would that go for me, right? That's not going to work. But, but sometimes when I think about this, I, I always think about critics and criticism. I always think, where's your movie, right? Here's a, here's a movie critic, and you think, well, where's your movie? Or a music critic, and I goes, where's your album? Like, what song have you written? You're really good at telling me what's wrong or what's right with other people's songs, but where's your song, right? Where's your lasagna if you're a food critic? Oh, this one's got a little too much salt. Where's your lasagna? Can I, w w let's critique it, right? So when I think about that, I always want to critique the critics. And when I think about that, again, critical thinking is what I titled this teaching, but I kind of subtitled it as some things can be, critique the critics, critique the critics. And critique is just kind of a highfalutin word, right? Like critic or cr critique, um, by putting a Q sound in there, it's, it's more refined, right? Uh, it's like putting a silent E on the end of something and you can charge more for it. Like if you live at something point and it has an E on the end, well, the price just went up, right? And so when I think about that, I'm like, okay, critique the critics. It sounds so... Um, you know, official that way. But I don't know if you know about the website Rotten Tomatoes. Maybe you do, maybe you don't. But if you like movies, uh, there is a site, RottenTomatoes.com, where you can basically go for free and see what people thought of certain movies before you pay your good money for it. You know, before you mortgage the house to pay for a movie, you say to yourself, is it worth it? And they give it a rating. They give it a rating, actually two ratings. There's two main ratings on this website. One is, what did the critics think? And second, what did the audience think? Okay, and those are two radically different scores. There's a, occasional times where the critics give it a 97% positive and what do you know, the audience give it a 97 or 96 or 95 or whatever. Everybody loves this movie. And you go, well, it's probably a pretty good bet. Then there's other times where like the critics adore it and the audience is like, Bleh. it was terrible, it was boring and awful and, and you know, the critics say it was important, an important film and you're like, well, yeah, but was it funny? Um, you, you know, and things like that. So the audience might have, have a completely different criterion that they are using to judge a movie. And again, sometimes in my own life, I have found that if the critics hated it, and the audience loved it, it's my kind of movie, um, right? Because it's not important. I just, for two hours, I didn't have to think. Thank you. That was worth my 12 bucks or whatever else. You know, all I did was eat popcorn and not think for two hours how that was worth my money. And the critics said, total waste of time. And I said, exactly. That's what I was looking for. And apparently that's what the audience was looking for. Because again, uh, audiences can feel very different than critics. So what am I saying here? Well, this is something that I want you to think on, which is that we as Christians ought to be critical. We ought to be critical. We are critical. Um, and there's good ways to be critical, and there's bad ways to be critical and everything else. So Christians should be critics. And one of the things they should critique is the criticism, right? What I mean by that is you are going to get criticism in your life. So am I. Everybody does. There are critics in your life. No matter what you're doing, someone's going to think something about it. If you're at work and you do something a certain way, someone will come in and evaluate that. Now, again, it might be their role. It might not be. You're like, you're not my boss. Um, right. But people will come in and they'll still say uh, unsolicited advice 
here's what I think of your work, you know, and you're like, thanks very much, but I don't really care. Or maybe there is something to what they say and it's important to listen to it. So I think about that and I think the first thing I've got to do is again, critique the critics because I'm going to have lots of them. So I've got to figure out who's, who's rating, whose opinion, whose input matters and, and should be reacted to in one way. I mean, and other, you go, well, that's interesting. They gave me a 1% positive, but guess what? It doesn't matter because I'm critiquing the critic and saying the source of that is not the source of my sense of whether I did something well or did not. So again, when you think about that, Christians should be critics, but Christians are critical. And I don't mean that they should go around criticizing people constantly, <laughs> constantly critical. What I'm saying is that we need critical thinking. If you're going to be a Christian, you have to have critical thinking. You have to know how to be a critic of the critics and decide this one matters, this one doesn't. This voice is important, this one isn't. And you also have to know that when you're coming into something, there's several different words or several different meanings of the word critical. Think about it this way. This is one of the reasons I love the English language because I already know it, but what if I didn't? I would hate it, right? If I was trying to learn it, I would hate it because critical can mean extremely negative, right? So, oh, this person is very critical of that. But guess what? A critic can actually be somebody who's voicing incredibly positive input about something and saying, critics rave about this movie. So you're like, I, I thought they were being critical of the movie. No, they're criticizing the movie positively. And you go, okay. And then you go critical. Someone's in critical condition in a medical field. What does that mean? <gasps> well, it's it's vital. They're, these are your you're in very delicate situation. Your life and death balance, right? I mean, you're in critical care. You're in need of intensive, sensitive care. And if something, someone is in a critical role at a company, you go, well, does that mean they criticize everyone? No, it means they're vital. They're important. They're, they're, they're crucial to what's going on. You go, wow, this is a, quite a word. So that's why I say we have to be critical in our thinking to realize, you know what? I'm not talking about critiquing things always negatively or being a super negative person. No, in, in fact, before we get into the passage, there's probably two things you're very familiar with because people talk about it this way, constructive criticism and destructive criticism. And see, when I think about it, you'll see both um, in your life, but in this chapter, you're gonna see that Paul is a guy who engages in constructive criticism. This is what the Bible also talks about as speaking the truth in love. Um, there are times in your life where you'll say something in love, but because it's it's true, someone might tell you, well, that's not very loving. That's not, how can you say that to me as a Christian? You go, how could I not say that to you as a Christian? Because um, again, there are things that need to be said, and there are things that Paul said that were very touchy, very difficult, very delicate, very critical, very crucial, and he wasn't being negative. He was positive that these things needed to be addressed. And so when you think about it, destructive criticism, uh, I think of it this way. Again, constructive is what God would say as God would say it. You know, Jesus was not a guy to mince words when he needed to. There were times where he said some very, very, very strong and crucial and critical things. And so his voice, I would say right away, you probably already figured out, he's a critic we should listen to. Like, if my life is a movie, Jesus can be the movie critic. If my life puts out music, Jesus can be the music critic. If my life puts out ministry, Jesus can be the ministry critic, right? If I have a marriage, Jesus can be the marriage critic. When I think about that, I want his input in every area of my life. And when I think about that too, my role, if I'm a Christian, is to, as best I can, to the best of my ability, my review ought to match his, shouldn't it? I mean, it makes zero sense for Jesus to give something two thumbs up and me to go, Bleh, I don't value that. You know, it just doesn't make any sense at all. So Christians are critical. We are important. We are valuable. But sometimes people say, oh, stop the negativity, and I go, you're saying it's negative because I said something that needs to be addressed? I don't, I critique that critic. No, I'm not going to listen to that. I'm not going to listen to someone who silences the criticism of something that needs to be improved. No, I'm not going to do that. 
So I can ignore certain voices in my life and say, well, they gave me two thumbs down, but I don't care. I really don't care. I'm going to keep making my move and I'm not going to make it any different. But there's other times where if God says, boo, you know, to my life, and maybe even uses someone to do that, that I would listen to myself and say, uh, let me critique the critic. What's the source? And I'm giving you, as Paul does, the way to figure it out because he does talk about it here. See, destructive criticism, I'm not big into that. Destructive criticism is what Satan would say as Satan would say it, right? I mean, he's going to criticize your life tremendously. Um, you know, he and his friends are going to criticize your life tremendously. So Jesus and his friends will criticize your life and Satan and his friends will criticize your life. And so I, I need to learn to discern and figure it out. Is it constructive? Is it destructive? I don't know about you, but I don't even like constructive criticism, frankly. Um, I say I do. Like, I'm, I'm like, hey, let me know what you think of this. And they go, well, it's kind of weak. And you go, uh, what do you know? You know, and you get all defensive on it because it's, it's hard to even accept constructive criticism. But one of the things I love about excellent people is they are able to listen to the right sources who tell them you are amazing and if you want to get even more amazing here's how you can do that because the, I did notice almost every professional athlete I know has a coach why do they have them they're the best in the world and they'd like to continue to be their best and they would like to continue to improve and that's why they have a coach. So when I think about this, constructive criticism, it's not easy to take either. But destructive criticism is not only hard to take, it shouldn't be taken, right? Do you, you understand the difference? Um, I, again, if, if the devil doesn't like my life, I think of that as a positive review. I'm like, thank you. I hate what you're doing. Excellent. Wonderful. Thank you. Um, you know, <laughs> that's actually a positive. So... When you think about this, Paul was a critic. He was a constructive criticism expert, I would say. He was really good. Um, I think it's one of the reasons God recorded his critique of the Corinthian church, of Christianity, of Christians. He, he, God recorded his, his criticisms of certain things because they were so important, right? We didn't get to see these individual lives being lived, but we got to read the review and go like, whoa, that's, wow, that's... Paul gave that one a, a yes. Paul gave that one a rotten tomato, right? Now, why is he doing that? Again, it's a good idea to have at least a few friends who tell you the truth in love. Um, I, I often tell people at work, you are my real friend, because they'll point something out. Like the other day, I, I got a, a new old shirt at... Uh, Uptown Cheapskate. It was, really, it was a really nice shirt, but it was used and it was off the clearance rack and everything. So I think it was like $3 or whatever. So I was proudly wearing that tag still on the shirt. I didn't know I was, but I, I had a tag that was under the arm that basically said clearance sale, you know, $3. And I'd gone through the whole day like this, you know, pointing things out, talking to people, everything else. Nobody said anything. I know people saw it. I, they had to have. And then I go to lunch and a guy I'm eating lunch with says, you know, you still have the tag on your shirt, right? And I'm like, oh, you are my true friend. I said, thank you. Thank you. I, I only, at least I know I have one because that was a constructive criticism. It was probably, hey, you don't want that, right? I mean, this might be something you could improve and something you could do. And I love Proverbs 27, 6. If you think that one through, Proverbs 27, 6, it says, better the wounds of a friend than the kisses of an enemy. What's it saying? Basically, that some people will tell you what you want to hear in front of your face, and then they'll go behind your back and say something different. I always like to put it this way. You know, it's, it's someone who will talk bad behind your back, that's an enemy. Someone who will talk bad to your face, that's a friend. <laughs> right? I know that sounds weird, but I'm not saying every day. I don't want to go through my whole life with a list of flaws that somebody's bringing there. But I love the fact that there are people in my life who have earned the right to be able to tell me I'm wrong, to say, hey, listen, this is way off. This is messed up. And I listen to it because of the source. I know I've critiqued the critic. But if I go through my whole life that anyone who tells me I'm on the wrong track, I change course, man, I'm going to be blown by the wind. I can't be a Christian and pay too much attention to the criticism. 
So Paul was a critical thinker. We should be too. He was a constructive critic. Critic. We can be too. And he had his critics, and they were mostly destructive, right? They were people who found fault with Paul, but they weren't doing it to further the gospel. They weren't doing it for Paul's benefit or, for that matter, for God's glory. They were doing it simply because people do it. People love to do it. People love to spectator sport life and give everything a review. Uh, it just so happened that we, we'll get into it here, but um, we were just over with, with Bethany watching um, ice skating. We just happened to hit an ice skating thing, and we were all sitting on the couch watching ice skating. And, um, you know, the critics come in with the difficulties and stuff, and they're like, oh, that was kind of under-rotated. And I'm thinking to myself, under-rotated? <laughs> Man, I'm rotating on the ice, but I'm flat on my stomach going this way. <laughs> this is the, there will be no under-rotation on me on ice skates. But I, was, I wondered to myself, I know sometimes the commentators are people who do it themselves and have done it before and are even, you know, experts in the field. But sometimes... You, you look at me and you go, you have never skated. I have n you don't even know, know how to do a trick. Oh, here comes the triple axle. Oh, the landing was a little soft on that. And you're like, <laughs> where's your triple axle, right? But, but when you think about this, destructive criticism, it could have been easy for us to sit on that couch, but we were really in awe going, I, can't, I, I don't even know how they do that. It's hard for me to get off this couch, right? To go get some ice water um, while I'm watching them. So destructive criticism, it, putting, someone in, it, putting yourself in someone's shoes is very, very important. So what does it look like practically? This is it. Next time someone tells you that's not very Christian about something you do or say, critique the critic. And if, you, if truly you were very unchristian in what you did, then do it differently. But you know what? Listen to the voice of reason in here, because this is Paul criticizing the critics. Verse 1, 2 Corinthians 10, he says, Now I, Paul, myself, am pleading with you by the meekness and gentleness of Christ, who in presence I am lowly among you, but being absent, I'm really bold toward you. But I beg you that when I'm present, I may not be bold with that confidence by which I intend to be bold against some who think of us as if we walked according to the flesh. For though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty in God for t pulling down strongholds, casting down arguments, every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God, bringing every thought into captivity into the obedience of Christ. And verse 6, he says, being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. I think about that. Every critic has a standard, right, that they judge things by, whether good or bad, right? Again, in that ice skating thing, we realize they have like technical difficulty, um, you know, creative thing. They have a, a rubric is what they call it in the academic world, but just a thing that you grade against, you know, so it's not completely arbitrary. And what I see here is that Paul gave us three things that God judges on, that God's criterion, you know, his critique, God's criterion of a life, Paul was using the one that God was using for him, right? So he was using it for others. And I love that because he's matching his way of looking at things with God's way of looking at things, trying to say things the way God would say them, the things God would say the way God's, God would say them, the things God would say the way God would say them. And so I think about this, God's criterion, first of all, is meekness, not weakness, See, he discusses that in there because he says, I'm going to be meek among you. I've been meek among you, but I wasn't weak among you. And I'm going to be bold. I, I know when I'm there, people think, well, he's not all that, you know, demanding or commanding. He's not a dictator when Paul's here. And then he goes off and he dictates these letters to us. And they're always strong in content. Like, what is with that guy? Is he like passive aggressive or what? And he says, no, it's just meekness. It's not weakness, it's meekness. And the difference is this. See, we're in a war. He says that. He talks about a battle. And there's no place for weakness in war, but there's definitely a place for meekness in war. If a person thinks that might makes right, it really doesn't. Might makes all kinds of wrongs. <laughs> and the, just because somebody has the, um, the upper hand 
physically or more arsenal or whatever it doesn't make them right it doesn't make the other person wrong you think about this meekness meekness will prevent an awful lot of things that weakness won't prevent again weakness doesn't prevent war i'm not trying to go into a strategy for war here but bottom line is weakness doesn't prevent war weakness doesn't prevent war by at my house spiritually or otherwise but meekness prevents all kinds of atomic bombs right meekness is this it's strength under control it's strength under control strength out of control is just what we see every day right but weakness is strength not under control it's just no strength and no control right it's just weakness it's just weak but god says here's what i'm going to judge you on i'm not asking you to be tough i'm asking you to be meek i'm asking you to be strength under control greeks use the word meek that he's using there to describe a military horse under the direction of its rider okay a military horse is anything but weak you don't want to be anywhere near the kick of that thing it ride right over you and it'll do exactly what it is meant to do. It is a war machine, <laughs> but it does what it's under the control of its rider. And so who is my commanding officer? Well, if I consider myself a Christian, Christ is, gives me my marching orders, my mouthing orders, everything I'm supposed to do and say and how I'm supposed to do it. And God is not looking for weakness. He doesn't go, oh, good, there's a weak believer. There's one who just meek and mild and never does anything, you know, and makes no waves and everything's cool and they're friends with everyone and nobody is ever upset. Jesus wasn't at all like that, contrary to what some of the pictures painted are. But he also wasn't out looking, picking for fights all the time either. He got into some. He got into some really difficult situations. But he wasn't looking for the fight, but he also wasn't running from them. So I think about this. Some people think being a Christian means always nice, sweet, positive, and affirming, right? No matter what it is. If, if I look at something, I go, oh, that's good. Two thumbs up. I like that. That's wonderful. Everything's great. You know, everything is beautiful in its own way. Um, you know, the theme song would be Home, Home on the Range, where the deer and the antelope play, and where there's never heard a discouraging word, and the, the skies are not cloudy all day. That's Christianity, right? Just blue skies and green lights, and everything's wonderful. And you go, well, I think that's a false view of Christianity. I'm going to critique the critics on that. Because, again, I have been at times critiqued, I believe, inaccurately, unfairly, because I will bring a situation and say, this is not right and this needs to change. And I've heard people say, we don't need that negativity in this organization. I'm like, we, we speak positive things here. And I'm like, well, I'm positive that this is wrong. Okay, is, this, is that clear enough? Um, and, and, again, it's in the sense of that, it's... This is a Christian environment. We don't want anyone to feel bad about what they're doing, things like that. And I'm like, so things go on that are wrong. They continue to fester and nobody addresses it because we don't want to be viewed as non-Christian. But again, it's a false view of Christ. It's the happy hippie, right? The peace, love, and, and all that and the, the, the things that Jesus would be, the long-haired hippie, right? Jesus wouldn't judge, and yet the Bible talks about him as the, the judge, right? It says he will judge the whole world. He is the judge. He is the critic. He is the critic of both Christian and non-Christian things. And if you ever rebuke somebody, get ready for it. You're probably going to hear, no matter how meekly you do it, you're probably going to hear, that's not Christian. Who are you to judge me? You can't judge me. Only Jesus can judge me. And you go, all right, that's fine. Um, but but I think about that. Look at, at Jesus. Jesus was meek, but he wasn't weak. He was gentle. He was patient, but he was bold when the times called for it, right? John chapter 2, you're probably familiar with it. There was a temple, and he made a whip of cords, and he drove people out. He turned over the tables, and he said, get out of this place. You are, you know, messing up my father's house. It was supposed to be a place to pray for people. You're praying on people in this place. Get out and guess what nobody came in and said get out of here you little weakling this guy somehow managed to drive out a bunch of people by himself i'm sure the whip helped 
But you think about this, Matthew 23, without a whip, so many times he, he would say things to the Pharisees. There were a lot of them and one of him. And he would say, you are snakes. You're hypocrites. You're whitewashed tombs. And people are like dead people inside. Uh, you look great on the outside, but you're all messed up on the inside. And, wow, that's not very Christian, Christ, for you to say that. Who are you to say that? Well, I I don't know, the one who sees inside. So I think about that again. I stop short because I can't see what he can see. But he does authorize us to speak truth in love and to live truth in love and to live truthful lives. And so never going to see in Scripture, you'll never see this. Jesus saying harsh words to an honest sinner. Somebody comes up, brings their best, brings even their worst to him. And he doesn't go, ugh, this life, what a disaster. You're a mess. What makes you think God would have any interest in you? Again, do you remember destructive criticism? That was what Satan would say and how he would say it. So a lot of times, this is what I'm inviting you to do and helping you equip yourself for others. Some of people's worst critics are that they listen to a critic in their head that isn't God. So they'll, they have a voice in their head. Maybe somebody put it there. Maybe somebody told them, you'll never amount to anything. You'll always be bad. You've already messed up. God has no time, place for that. All that kind of thing. You're not like the good people. You're just a messed up one, whatever. All those crazy theological thoughts that people have. And you'll never see Jesus ever do that. He never, never was a harsh critic of an honest sinner, ever Ever. I searched the scripture, can't find it. When did Jesus get bold? When did he get bold? When did his words get strong? Not even when he was being hurt, but when others were being hurt. When the powerless, when weak people were being mistreated by strong people, Jesus got bold. Very bold. That's when he got in, when, when God's reputation was being ruined or when people's lives were being destroyed. Jesus got very bold. When whip, you know, when wolves... Wolves got the whip. The hypocrites, <laughs> they got his harsh criticism. But run-of-the-mill sinners, he'd give them the, you know what? Two thumbs up, man. You, you, you got a future. You got a hope. Uh, you got a sequel to this life. There's more there. Um, you know, not th th this isn't your best work, but, but g g you know, he draw it out of them. And in the same way, you see 2 Corinthians 10, Paul is following his example. He says, I'll be meek, but I'm not going to be weak. He had pleaded with them. He was patient. You even see the words beg in there several times. He says, I'm begging you guys. I'm really, I'm, I'm pleading with you. I am uh, imploring you, right? I, he's not like commanding and all the rest. And he says, you guys... Sometimes people will say, oh, he's just a weakling. And he says, no, I'm a meekling. <laughs> I'm meek on this. That we used to have a, a well, our dog's kind of like this, but there was another one in our neighborhood that, that was even more this way. And this dog would bark at you. And I used to have fun with it because it would run at me and bark. And if I, all I did was had to like do one little head fake at it and it'd go, yee, yee, yee. <laughs> and then I'd go back this way and it'd go, rah, 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 coming at me. And I'd turn back and, yee, yee, you know, and it'd yip. And, and I just, I, that was our game. I had the most fun with that dog. But, you know, I think about it. It never got close enough to bite me. But, you know, this is what Paul's basically saying. You, you, everyone's saying, oh, he's just a little yippy dog. He says, guess what? I do carry an authority that comes with the word of God. And he says, the dog will bite you because the truth will bite you if you're not careful. And so he uses the words of warfare. He says, I'll exhaust diplomacy, but I'm not afraid to fight on this. But not a physical fight. He wasn't challenging him to that. He was challenging him to a spiritual reality. And um, I was really big into comic books when I grew up. I still enjoy the, now all the movies come out, you know, it pretty much uh, a lot of times movie critics say, eh, superhero movies. You know, sometimes they get good stars, but a lot of times the critics are like, they're all the same. And I'm like, exactly. And that's why the audiences keep loving them. And they were like, yes, more of the same. You know, we love that. But what I always loved was the nerdy guy who was like super nerdy. And then they just take their glasses off and suddenly they were Superman. And this is kind of what Paul's saying is like, they look at him like nerdy little Apostle Paul, but he's like, I am serving God with, with a boldness and a, and a reality to what I'm doing and I, I love that you know there, there's something in there and he begs 
But he says, don't, don't, don't make me take my glasses off, right? <laughs> don't, don't let me rah, rip the shirt and go, it's the Hulk. You know what happened? He, he can do that. And what he was saying is, I can do that in a spiritual sense because this is critical. It's a life and death matter. I am, we're dealing with people's souls here, with people with, dealing with people's families. We're dealing with people's futures here. And I've always thought about that with, with ministry. You know, ministry is not like other things. You know, you can get a job at a place or you can do things. But when, when you, and I'm not just talking about me, I'm talking about you. When you go into somebody's home and a friend called me the other day and just said, hey, you know, I'm going to, they've asked me to talk at a funeral um, can I talk it over with you before I talk it with them? I just, I, you know, I, I have some thoughts, but I, I really don't want to mess it up. I want, you know, this will be remembered. People care. These, there's broken hearts there. I want to say the right things and none of the wrong things. What was he doing? Rather than hearing a critique after it where you go, whoa, that guy said horrible things at the funeral. He was actually going in first and saying, I want to make the best possible ministry movie I could make. Critique it now. You know, critique, here's some of the thoughts I had. How would you phrase this? You know, and things like that. And we, I took it seriously, and so did he. Why? Because it's life and death. It matters. People's hearts matter. People's souls matter. And so he says, the weapons of our warfare aren't carnal. Um, it, they're not physical threats. They're not manipulations. They're not rules and regulations and all these things. He's saying... Uh, the weapons of our warfare are spiritual, and then I can lay them out. You know them. It's it's prayer. It's it's the word of God. It's it's the spirit of God operating actively within somebody to hold their tongue sometimes where they could say something harsh and they don't, or maybe to move their tongue to say something difficult, even though. Hey, I've, I've prayed about this. I've thought about it. I've I've done this but i'm placing this phone call to talk with you about it because you matter to me and this needs to be addressed and if it isn't man lives hang in the balance the weapons of our warfare this is what he's talking about he says they're mighty in god and i like this he says for pulling down strongholds um again just thinking on it real quickly one of the movies i love i love war movies i don't like war i don't like violence but i love war movies and the reason is war movies are intense there's like a a leadership lessons in them i always learn things about life i learn things about the spiritual battle when i watch war movies some of my favorite quotes in life come from war movies that i'm like that's life right there that is it right there And I remember somebody saying in a war movie, the one with the high ground wins. Whoever has the high ground wins. Whoever has the, the, you know, if you're running up a hill toward people who are at the top of the hill shooting at you, that's why you're always trying to gain the high ground. You always want to get the, you know, the castle pouring the hot oil down on the person who's underneath the hot oil trying to get up the wall, which is easier. High ground wins. And I've thought about that, and this is where he says, we're pulling down the high ground. We're pulling down the high, exalted arguments of all the excuses why people behave the way they do. Well, I was, you know, I was brought up this way, or I'm, you know, it's just my culture, or whatever else. And you go, that's, that's a very high ground. That's a very strong hold. That's a, we have a family history of, and you go, that's, that's amazing, but you know what? Um, God's about futures, not histories, you know, and, and when you think about that, it's, he's saying the truths that God's word contains pull down human high grounds that people are, are in there, socked away, losing the war, losing the battle, criticizing others, throwing things at other people. And, and God says, I gotta, I gotta crumble that castle so I can build my kingdom. I think about that, it's really interesting to me because, again, cross-reference Ephesians 6.12, he says, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. So, you know, you think about that, God has the high, ultimate high ground on stuff, but there are things that can seem impossibly high to surmount. So, again, am I going to conquer those things with my strength no but i'm also not going to conquer them with weakness i'm going to conquer them with meekness that's why god's criteria when he looks at a life he says is this a meek thought not is this a weak thought oh i probably can't do it that's a weak thought 
I can't do it without God's help. That's a meek thought. I can do it without God. That's a, that's, that's a prideful thought. So you see the difference between those? I can't, weak. God can't, <laughs> weak. I can with God's help. That's meek. And so God's criteria, he says, I'll give that a positive review. <laughs> and so then you see in here, people might have had opinions of Paul's feedback, but God said, right on the money, meekness, not weakness. Second one, judging the inside, not the outside. Look at verse 7 with me. He says, do you look at things according to the outward appearance? If anyone's convinced in himself that he's in Christ, let him again consider this in himself, that just as he's in Christ, so are we in Christ. See, there were people saying, hey, we're Mo who's Paul? We're, we're, the, we're the Christian people here. He's not even here. And so he says, oh, if you're so good at reflecting on things, why don't you reflect on the fact that I'm in Christ? If you are, I am. <laughs> and he says, even if I should boast somewhat more about our authority, which the Lord gave us for edification, that means building up, and not for your destruction. Remember, constructive edification, not destructive I shall not be ashamed, lest I seem to terrify you by letters. See, here's the critic. It's in quotes. You see it in verse 10. He says, for his letters, they say, are weighty and powerful, but his bodily presence is weak. His speech is contemptible. Well, let that critic consider this, verse 11, that what we are in word by letters when we are absent, well, we'll be that indeed when we're present. What's he saying? The sequel might look different than the original. He went to Corinth with a meekness, with a gentleness, with patience, with all kinds of things that he said, but if I come back and some of y'all are still being destructive, I might uh, take it up a notch. I might interact with you on a different level than I did before. You think my letters are tough? I'll look you in the eye and say it even more directly. <laughs> you know, I will, I'll stand right toe to toe with you and we'll talk about this and we'll see how it works out. See, I think about that again. Some people say, oh, I, I'm not into that. You know, my Christianity doesn't include that. Um, I, if you relish those things, you can see Paul is not looking for a fight. But again, he's looking to say, I, if, if your inside has not changed to such an extent that you're still judging people by outward appearance and putting people down and pay, making name calling and stuff, he says, we're going to address that. And see, I think about it for me as an administrator at a school. Kids will be kids, and I'll let them be kids, and I'll even let them mess up some and do everything else. But at some point, I will definitely stand in and up for, as an administrator, a kid who's being taken advantage of by another kid. Again, I, I don't immediately try to resolve every fight. A lot of times, I'm like, let them fight. <laughs> let them figure it out. Let them, let them, you know, name call. Well, he called me a name, and what name did you call? Well, that's irrelevant right now. You know, it's, it's like, okay, there was a lot going on on both sides, right? But there's times where you just realize, hey, listen, next time in my office, I even said this to a kid, this time in my office, man, we've had a great time. I laughed a few times, you laughed a few times, I told you can't do that anymore, I told you a story about my own youth and how I messed up myself sometimes, you know, this is great. But guess what? Visit number two won't be at all like this, I just want you to know. Visit number two is where your parents are here. And visit number two is where maybe you like miss some school and, and you know, have a thing in your permanent record. So I'm just letting you know that, right? We're we're good, right? And so I let him know that, and that's what Paul's kind of doing here. He's saying the inside judging, um, that's what God does. But he said this outside thing, criticizing people, name-calling, all that kind of stuff, he says, that's not going to work. See, and I love it again because he said, God gave me an a, a authority for construction, not destruction. And his critics took a classic elementary school playground approach, which was making fun of his appearance. They said, basically, he has the perfect body for letter writing, right? The perfect face for that. They're like, he's, he's like um, extra biblical things. You take it for what it is. You know, some people don't believe it. Some do. But um, there, there's no biblical description per se of Paul. But there are writings from the time that wrote of Paul. And Paul, apparently, I, the best I can think of from a movie perspective is Danny DeVito. Um, for the rest of your life, you'll always picture... Paul the Apostle is Danny DeVito. But, you know, the, the, the guy who's just like short and, and, and stocky and, and just kind of like, you know, running around. And, and that's Paul, right? There's, there's implications that he had 
eye problems that were not very pleasant to look at. Um, the, the, he had been beaten and left for dead several times. He lived a very harsh life. You know, this guy was, uh, you know, older than his his chronological age was one thing, but his appearance was probably worse than that. He wasn't winning any cover of the magazine for Christianity, you know, uh, sexiest apostle alive or something like that. I mean, it just wasn't going to happen. And so here they have him saying he's not that great looking. He's not that cute. Um, and they're criticizing that. And you think about this. God says, what does that have to do with anything? Notice he would pick somebody like Paul because of what was going on inside, not because of what was going outside. First Samuel 16, 7 says this, The Lord does not see as man does. Man looks at the outward. God sees the heart. So false teachers... One of the things that was true about him then, and I'm not saying it, that if a, if a pastor or a leader is attractive, they're automatically bad. That, is a, that, that would not be a fair statement. But a lot of times, a lot of times, people are so enamored by a charismatic person, they're like, he's tall and good looking and dresses so amazing. He has the anointing of God. Just look at him. They're celebrities, you know, and you go, that that megawatt smile and all those things. And you go, did, did Paul have any of those things? Did Jesus have any of those things? Well, I don't, I don't know. But, uh, you know, in Christ, as Christians, we've got to learn to look past the appearance of people. Because for Paul, they, this is what they were saying. They were saying, uh, you know, he's not that impressive. He doesn't have the star quality. You know, he wouldn't make it on American Idol or The Voice or The X Factor or the, you know, dance shows or any of that. And if their culture had an idol show, you know, Corinthian Idol, this is the thing. It wouldn't have been based on singing. A lot of ours are singing and dancing. We like all that, you know, that kind of entertainment or magicians or whatever. But you know what it was in, in Greek culture? You still know it if you pay any attention. Greek culture, famous for two things, good looks and good oration, silver tongue. You know, the, the debates, the philosophers, the Greek philosophy, the ability to have this amazing iron-clad, highfalutin argument that you couldn't even understand, much less counter. And Paul was a guy who said, yeah, I know, the cross, I'm coming with a message that isn't, you know, like, I'm, wow, that's so deep. I, he came with a message so simple that even a child could understand it, which is that, God took your place on the cross. And the, and the Greek philosophers went, oh, please. This is what you got, Paul? I mean, come on. You got to get into the deep stuff. You got to get into the esoteric arguments and all this. And so Paul didn't do well on either of their criteria. He wasn't much to look at. And they said he wasn't much to listen to. Now, I personally would have loved to have listened to him. I, I look at his writings and I'm like, deep, difficult, challenging. But by their perspective, again, it, to the Greeks... To the philosophers, he even said foolishness. Their own philosophers were like, foolishness. Uh, you know, a man three days dead came back from the dead. Uh, heroes are not killed. But, you know, they're strong. There are all these things. The Greek gods were not like Jesus. And so when you think about this, I don't know what it was, but people basically told him, you know what? Preaching ain't your thing. You should stick to tent making. You should just, you're pretty good at tents. But they critiqued him his ministry, and you think about this mostly by external factors. I remember the first teaching I ever did, um, it was not very memorable, except for one reason. I was at a music stand, much like this one, and I adjusted it up and down like 10,000 times because I was nervous, right? Um, I don't know what you do when you're nervous. I also, I, I clicked a pin, too. I was like, click, 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 click. <laughs> <laughs> and so a friend um, showed me the video. They had actually videotaped it, and he fast-forwarded, and it looked like I was pumping up a tire. <laughs> He's like, wow, that, you really pumped them up on that one. Yeah, and I'm like, okay, fine. You know, and, and it, I, I could receive that criticism because I wanted to get better. I wanted to improve and everything else. But when you think about it, we live in a world that is absolutely ruthless with physical criticism. And you know what? This again, I want, I, I want us to critique the critics for just a moment. The older I get, it, it's funny. Um, 
I was reading it just the other day that guys are getting more and more aware of this because media, you know, guys used to not care how we looked. We don't care. Um, you know, ladies lived under this uh, pressure to look great all the way to 150 years old. And, you know, but, but it's kind of like guys are, are, they're selling tons of products to guys now for guys to stay looking 20 when they're not, you know, and all that sort of stuff. And I, I'm all for doing the best you can, all that kind of stuff. But, but the point is we live in a society that, criticizes that tremendously you post a picture online and instead of hey your family looks great it's like wow you got old you know and stuff and you're like just ruthless people there are ruthless people out there and silencing the right critics are really important in your life i mean if you live by a, a, a standard that you think the outward is what matters well god is judging the inward and he looks at that and says you can go from glory to glory you can get better and better your spirit can be more beautiful at, at a later age than you than you were when you were younger and and when you think about that that's living with the right critic in your mind to say is this growing your spirit how's your what are your spiritual goals for 2018 you know um i want my spirit to grow you know um I, and and if people spend time on that that's what's going to matter but people can't wait in our society to snap pictures of celebrities looking terrible um, there's whole websites dedicated to, you know, people who, do, oh, they, she was amazing when she was 12, but look at her now, you know, and you're like, she's 112, um, you know, give her a break, <laughs> you know? I mean, give me a break, and so you think about this critical thinking, some very critical thinking, the last standard here, I think this is the biggest one for me, I hope it's big for you, it's compared to our spheres, not to our peers, our spheres, not our peers. What do I mean by that? Well, take a look with me at verse 12 to the end here. You know, again, God's standards here were the three that he might stack your life up against, and you can, you can try to apply these to yourself and apply them to others. Meekness, not weakness, you know, inside, not outside, but comparing to your sphere and not your peer. He says, verse 12, what we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves you know, <laughs> yay, I'm giving myself the best employee of the month, you know, and I'm also the boss. But they, measuring themselves by themselves, comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. Verse 13, we, however, won't boast beyond measure, but within the limits of the sphere. There's the word that I used, which God appointed us, a sphere which especially includes you. Verse 14, we're not overextending ourselves as though our own authority didn't extend to you, for it was to you that we came with the gospel of Christ. He says, verse 15, I'm not boasting of things beyond measure, that is, in other men's labors. I'm having hope that as your faith is increased, we shall be greatly enlarged by you in our sphere. There's that word again. To preach the gospel in the regions beyond you and not to boast in another man's sphere of accomplishment. Verse 17, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord, for it's not the one who commends themselves that are approved, but whom the Lord commends. And that's an important passage. I hope you'll go home and think on it. Um, compare to your sphere, not to your peer. Critics love to compare people with other people, with other peers. You know, other movies released at the same time, favorably or unfavorably. Well, it's not as good as the original. Uh, this director didn't do as good a job as this director. The sequel was worse, or the prequel was better, or all that kind of thing. Or, you know, even I could do better than that film. You know, my kid making a movie could do better than that. And Paul criticizes them. He critiques the critics by saying, you guys are all comparing yourselves among yourselves, which is not making any sense anyway. He says, man's opinion whether positive or negative, is really of no input, very little input. Seeking man's glory isn't going to do much for you. If you get a positive review from everyone but God, what has it done for you? And if you get a negative review from everyone except God, what has it done to you? 
See, what he's saying here is a mutual admiration society. Oh, your film was amazing. Well, your film was amazing. I know it was amazing, but not as amazing as all of our films will be because we make our films and we're the film society and we're so great. And you're like, I pat your back, you pat my back, all that kind of stuff. He's saying that that's nothing. Flattery, people love to flatter people, right? Self-serving, you're so great. No, you're so great. No, we're so great. You know, say it's us and I'll agree. We are the best. A lot better than Paul, right? <laughs> oh, Paul. Yeah. Oh, I forgot all about him. Is he even out there still making? Oh, he's, oh, he wrote a letter. I didn't read it. You know, that sort of stuff. He said, That's not very wise. Nobody ever reaches their potential by be to being told lovely lies, by never hearing tough truths. Have you ever wondered how those talent shows sometimes have some completely talentless people? I mean, sometimes they have amazing people, but they actually do it for the ratings. They pick horrible, joke, bad singers for the first rounds because people tune in to watch that. People actually tune in to go, oh my goodness, this person is awful. Has nobody ever told them that they, they're like terrible? Well, the judge is about to watch this and the judge will just blast them out and they're like, ah, you know, and everything. And the person, well, I, everyone's told me I'm great, so I'm going to go be great. And, and you think, well, there's a self-denial to that. There's a, there's a lack of reality to that. Nobody ever got great through that. But you know what? Nobody ever really got great by being told how horrible they were all the time either. I don't think that really is the thing that's conducive to human growth. See, I think what is, is that when you have a standard that you have somebody who will say what God would say the way God would say it. That's, that's when I think about it. You know, comparing your sphere. What does this mean? I, I never judge myself on whether I'm a good ice skater or not. That's not part of my sphere. <laughs> I just, God hasn't made that part of my life. So if everywhere I watch on TV, I see somebody great at something and I go, oh, I'm, I'm a worthless human being. I don't skate. I don't play basketball like that. I mean, these are all people in their sphere. But why am I comparing myself to them? If I watch a show and somebody has so much... Man, they're, they're just they're great looking. They're, they got all the money in the world. And I'm like, that's their sphere. That's, they will be accountable to God for their sphere. This is my sphere. This is what I will do. I'll stand before the Lord for the options and opportunities he gave me. And I think that's really great because comparison is the total thief of joy. I mean, I, if I look at somebody else, I'm either going to get puffed up in pride, well, I'm, well, at least I'm not that bad, I'm better than that person, or I'm going to say, oh, well, they're so much better than I am, I must not have anything to offer. God won't ask, Scott, why weren't you more like Abraham? Why weren't you more like Moses? Like, why didn't you get the people into the promised land? And stuff like that. I'm like, I wasn't there. Um, that's not my sphere, right? I won't answer to that, but I'll answer to all kinds of things that were my sphere. And when I think about that, it's an important thing because God is my critic, but he's my biggest fan. I think that's important to remember. He's, he's my biggest fan. He is not the one tearing down my work. He's the one building up my life. The one saying, you know what? It did have a good scene in it. <laughs> you know, that one scene was really good. And you're like, yeah, how's the rest of the movie? That one scene was really good, you know? And, and I love that because he's the one giving me a future as well. And to do that, to, to have that perspective, we have to be able to look with some critical thinking. Again, I come back to it to close it out. If you just think everything in life is good, that everyone does, or that everyone's voice has an equal weight in your life, anyone can derail what God is doing in your life just simply by criticizing it. Oh, I don't agree with that. Oh, well, I better change it. You go, no. It, critique the critic. Critique the critic in your mind. Is, is the critic meek? Are they, are they speaking to a weakness in your life? Are, the, are, they, are, are you bringing out meekness, which is strength under control? Hey, I've got strength in that area. I've got control in that area. God has got control in that area. That's great. It, am, I, am I somebody who's, are they judging the outside? Oh, you looked really stupid when you did that. And you're like, oh, I did? Well, okay. Was what I did stupid? Because what I was wearing or what I was doing when I was sharing is not as important as, as who I am. If, if you want to get the things that I'm doing or am that need adjustment, then that's one thing. But it's amazing how people can wilt people just with a comment that makes them very self-conscious. 
And so it's not what does so-and-so think about this. It's what does Jesus think about it. And I come back to it to, get, to close it out. The truth in love, constructive criticism. I think the cross um, stands as, a, as a, a one, like kind of a symbolic criticism of my life. Can I put it that way? What does it tell me? It tells me it was bad. Your, your life is bad. Why? <laughs> it required the cross, right? But it's a plus symbol, right? I mean, it's also a plus symbol. So it, it, it tells me two things. It tells me that God says, you are a sinner and you are a winner. Those are the two things the cross tells me. I mean, really, it tells me it was bad, but it's good. That's what it, that's, it's kind of like the rotten tomato symbol. I, all I have to do, whenever I look at the cross, that's the, the criticism of my life. So if I, if I think my life isn't bad and that I don't need Jesus, God's going to critique that, <laughs> right? But if I think I'm so bad that he can't do anything about it or a situation so bad that he can't do anything about it, he's going to critique that too and say, the cross says two things. People are sinners, but I can make them into winners. That's it. Two thumbs up on that. So 2 Corinthians 10, critique the critiques, do some critical thinking, think through what voices you put into other people's lives and what voices people put into your life, and make sure that you're listening to the audience of one. Thank you, Lord, for what you do. I uh, pray that you would take the things that we do say and are and uh, put them through the, the criterion to come out of the cross and, and see those things through those eyes. And I pray that we would be able to be as people, able to say the things you would say the way you would say them to people. And of course, first of all, to ourselves, and then beyond that, in our sphere of influence. We pray it in Jesus' name.